Hello and welcome everybody to another uh, expert panel discussion today, which is on the subject of how to close better and more. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Um, we're really excited to do this today because let's face it, closing is an issue that affects everybody in sales or connected to sales. So I'm delighted to have such a great panel today. So as I said, it's brought to you by SalesPop, uh, salespop.net. I encourage you to uh, read and subscribe to this online sales magazine. All of the people who are on the uh, panel today are regular contributors, so you can get their words of wisdom uh, on salespop.net and as I said Pipeliner CRM the world's most visual CRM so here's our panel uh, Lisa Magnuson John Fannery and Janice Mars but what I'm going to do is rather than read off their bios I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and, and tell you a little bit about themselves and then we'll dive straight into the panel discussion so uh, Lisa why don't you kick off and tell everybody a little bit about yourself yeah, thanks, Sean. Well, uh, my company is Top Line Sales, and my specialty is working with VPs of sales and their teams to uh, identify and develop and close their largest opportunities. And we sort of uh, define those as maybe like at least 5x their average contract size. And so to do that, I've got war room, services, coaching, training, uh, playbooks, that kind of thing. Excellent. And John? Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Flannery with Flannery Sales Systems. We help companies to refine and implement a repeatable process to drive revenue. When I say that to people at cocktail parties, they walk away. So what I say to them... <laughs> Generally, is that I'm in the sales training business, but we focus on three pieces, helping our customers to refine the process from lead to revenue, the selling skills that go with each of those steps, and then lastly, the critical part is the coaching and implementation of those skills and steps from the management team. Uh, pleased to be with you all today. Excellent. And Janice? Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you guys are. Um, but thank you, John. Um, so uh, at Sales Latitude, uh, we're, we're actually all about helping our clients get more predictable growth. And we do that by helping our clients shift their focus from kind of their own sales process to the buyer's buying process. And our approach ensures that both in the near-term and long-term pipeline activity is in direct alignment with where their buyers, executives are spending their time, money, and resources. So in reality, I do a lot of similar things that Lisa and John do, but I think we all kind of go about it in our own special ways. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so let's get right uh, straight into the panel discussion. And I guess I just wanted to start off with maybe a, a, a fundamental uh, baseline setting question. So is is closing its own skill or just another part of the sales process and uh, you know you need other skills well it's just all part of the process or is it really its own skill um maybe janice you want to start off with that sure uh, well actually when i when i see that question i actually think of the answer yes i actually think it's both mm -hmm. i think closing is its own skill and I think it's part of the sales process, but I don't think as part of the sales process, process, it's a specific activity in a sales process. I think closing is something that's done at every stage of the sales process um, as you're trying to understand, you know, kind of what your buyer's engagement is, you know, at that level of that of where you are in the stage process. But I do think that closing is also a skill. And by that, what I mean is, is that it, it does take the ability to be a little bit confrontational, a little bit provocative, uh, and to kind of ask the tough questions in order to be able to do that. And so I do think that there are certain uh, uh, skills that are needed and certain competencies as well. That's why I see it. Excellent. And uh, Lisa? 
Yeah, well, I certainly agree with everything that Janice just said. Um, but with my focus on the really complex accounts, the big deals, the whales, if, if you will, um, I like to think about closing less as an entity in and of itself, but more of a facilitating natural conclusions. I kind of uh, you know, when you think about closing, to me, it's a little bit like handling objections. And and today, uh, people would say, well, I don't, you know, customers don't want to be handled. They want you to work with them to resolve any concerns they have. Uh, so it's it's different. And I, and I think the same applies to closing. Customers don't want to be closed. They want you to help them sort of facilitate, you know, the natural conclusions. And I, I definitely agree with Janice that sometimes that takes some special skills to do that. And, but you don't have to wait till the end. They start really early. Um, and I'm sure John's going to, to, to weigh in on this point. They start way early in the sales process. And so by the time you get kind of to the end, it's actually really easy to do that. Excellent. Thank you. And John, your, your perspective. Uh, my perspective is it's not a skill on its own. I'm listening to my co-panelists here speak. And I guess we would have to define closing or confirming, because you certainly do have to be confirming a clear next step with your buyers on each stage of an advancement. But I would say that closing is part of the overall skill set um, that are connected to the ones that come before it. I think way too much emphasis is placed on closing. I think taking a negotiation only class, like some uh, some people, some organizations in our industry offer, I, I don't think you can just take a closing class and improve your sales results because the closing of the negotiation is tied into the pieces that come before that. And and John, I see we'll get to that later on in the um, in the webinar. So I say it's not standalone per se. Um, and just part of the continuum. Excellent, thank you. And just for people listening, if you have any questions, just put them into the question box and I'll relay them to the, the panelists. Okay, so here, here's, a, here's a common one, right? Uh, you know, when people are in the sales process, you know, sometimes they get a little over eager. Um, sometimes they think they have covered everything. So they jump in and try and go for a close too early. So what what are some of the dangers of trying to close too early? And, and uh, how can you tell maybe if, uh, you know, how can you overcome that instinct? And how can you kind of self check to make sure that you're not jumping in too early with the close? Um, maybe, John, do you want to kick that one off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, there are opportunities for a seller, and, and I like, I forget if it was Janice or Lisa who said to make sure they understand the buying process before uh, trying to advance a sale. But trying to close too early to convince or persuade or to get somebody to do they don't want it, they, something they don't want to do is just simply not going to happen. Um, and I think you will push them right out the door in some circumstances by trying to close too early. I caution sellers and their managers to stay away from the stereotypical bad sales behavior, which is documented in every sales book that talks about um, trying to manipulate, trying to advance too quickly, trying to fit something in where there's no value. So I think that the danger of doing that, and this can happen with existing customers or new prospects, um, I think the opportunity to go back to that customer or that prospect when you've tried to close them too early closes a window quickly. Um, I think it creates an atmosphere where that relationship can be tarnished down the road for future opportunities and um, can be very dangerous overall. Excellent. And um, how about you, uh, Lisa? What do you think? Well, I'll tell sort of a funny story here. So I like to do a lot of pre-call planning with my with my clients. Um, and again, we're talking the longer sales mm -hmm. cycles, the higher value sales cycles. So we do, you know, 
most every call deserves a really good pre-call plan. And how I approach that is the first thing I'll ask them is, what do you want to accomplish in this meeting? And inevitably, they say, I want to close, you know, whatever, (laughs) you know, close, close, close the deal. (laughs) And then we go through the rest of the thought process. Well, what do you think the customer wants to, uh, you know, accomplish in this meeting? And, you know, what do you think would make it valuable for the customer? And what would the customer perceive as the next steps? And, you know, we kind of go through the, the whole the whole thought process and then we come back around to to what they want to accomplish and realize how ridiculous, you know, that was most of the time, you know, they are literally not in the position to close. They're not at that Mm -hmm. point in the sales process. The customer's not at that point in their buying process. And so, you know, by doing it in a pre-call planning environment, then they adjust their expectations and, and that frees them up to be on the same page with the customer and, and and make sure the agenda is, you know, kind of spot on. But it, it, it always just surprises me. That's the first thing out of their mouth. Most times I want to close for right. X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think, uh, I, I, just one thing, I think uh, sometimes it's also an issue that it's, um, uh, you know, people's sales process, they're, they're not rigorous enough in, in, in the sales process, and they sometimes think they're further along than they are. And, you yes. know, salespeople can be extremely optimistic. So, uh, you know, yes. they think, well, wow, well, I'm at this, I'm at stage five of the process now. And if you really examine it, you're saying, well, no, you're really at stage three. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Um, how about you, Janice? What are some of the dangers of trying to close too early? And how can you and how can maybe a salesperson identify in themselves that maybe they're getting a little ahead of themselves? Well, actually, I liked what you just said a second ago. I, I love the idea of when the salesperson says I'm in stage X mm-hmm. because I, as an example, you know, sent a proposal or did a demo. And let's say that's the checkbox. Mm-hmm. When in reality, if you were to understand more about where the, you know, where the buyer's engagement is, you may see that, that they are way at the beginning of their buying process. <laughs> and so, um, you know, closing too early off. Uh, obviously is a danger because the customer is in, you know, in their mode, they know the priorities that they have to accomplish. They know the timeframes that they have to get it done. And you're probably trying to force that into your quarter end, year end, whatever it might be. Um, to me, the, the danger of closing too early is, is the relationship. Right. It's the credibility. Um, in so many, t- so many cases, I'm so surprised when management forces salespeople to push deals to close mm-hmm. earlier mm-hmm. because they're not doing you know any benefit to themselves you know their sales team or their customer or prospect yeah. so to me the danger is a lot having to do with relationship and credibility people move around uh it's it tends to be even though you know we sell globally it mm-hmm. tends to be a small world and uh, i think that if we understand how and where the buyer is in their buying process, we'll get a lot of good tell signs as to, you know, when is the right time. Uh, and of course, it gets back to the first question you asked: What does close mean? And I kind of liked what Lisa said with the uh, uh, the confirmation, uh, you know, confirming along the way, uh, uh, along the sales process. So I think the biggest danger is that. Mm-hmm. No, ag- agreed. And I think, um, and I think the other thing um, that we always have to bear in mind as well is, uh, I think sometimes people don't actually ask the ask the buyer about their buying process, or about uh, or about what had what the particular process is going to look like. Um, I think that's a big miss sometimes, and then it comes down to guesswork. Okay, well, just just quickly on the. On the flip side, and, and Lisa, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Lisa, maybe you want to try and kick this one off uh, quickly. Um, oh, uh, thanks, conversely. John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Conversely, trying to close too late. Well, I would say if the buyer is begging you for a contract, that might be a, <laughs> a flag. If, if the buyer is moved into implementation before you have a contract in place, they're just moving forward anyway. That would be another red flag. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, you know, the trying to close too late, I haven't seen that a, a, a lot. It can it certainly can happen. But if you are, um, I, I do a lot of sales process work with my clients. I know Janice does too. I bet John does as well. And it's, it's when you sort of take apart the sales process and say, okay, you know, what are those activities that are happening? And, and, and for each stage of that process, you know, what are, you know, what's that verifiable evidence? That's, that's something that Janice talks about a lot um, in, in her work. Uh, you really don't get to a place where you're closing too early or conversely <laughs> too late. Um, so I, you know, kind of to me the cure for 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 both of those is 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 really understanding that sales process that represents best practices and checking on that as you're doing your pre-call planning to, to me if you do both of those things you're going to get it right most of the time um so actually so john have you ever seen people try to close too late it's interesting. I'll ask salespeople who wants to extend the sales cycle, and I've never seen a hand go up. Um, I did see it. There was a circumstance when I was working with a medical device company where they were introducing a new uh, product that was going to replace an existing product line, and it was late on the um, on the release. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to slow things down. <laughs> and as my, thir as my 13 year old daughter would say, that was awkward. Um, so they were trying to slow things down and um, it, it made for a very uncomfortable situation. But no, I don't know of those who have slowed it down so much, nor do I know any buyers who say to sellers, you know, what stage are we in? Because I'm anxious to get this going. Yeah. So, um, Tr trying to close too late is a, is a situation where if they haven't established value, if they haven't gotten to key players, if they don't have the full picture and they're not ready, uh, missing that window when somebody's ready to go is um, it could end the opportunity. Yeah. So I think there's a few clues and I'm hoping first line managers when they're grading opportunities and reviewing pipeline, that they're asking enough questions to make sure they understand when it should close. And I'll joke with sellers in workshops and say, if we really wanted to know, we would invite the customer or the prospect to your forecasting meeting because their date will actually, and that, that would be uh, difficult as well, but we'll, we'll get a better sense of that. I'm hoping in the coaching sessions, managers are really getting to an understanding when it should happen, as confirmed by the prospect or customer. Yeah, excellent. Um, and um, and Janice, quickly, any have you ever seen this uh, phenomena of somebody just being too cautious and too late to the party? You know, I haven't really seen that very often. Um, you know, from a sales process perspective, we tend to, uh, you know, work with our clients to develop some something like a sequence of events document or a joint evaluation document where early in the sales process you're working with your customer to understand you know kind of their 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 buying process and their time frames mm -hmm. and then of course that gets refined through the sales process so that it becomes kind of a uh, a joint responsibility yeah, and, and we do that mainly because we want to make sure that when we're uh, that we're going to deliver on the time frame of the customer, and we want to make sure that we're forecasting it correctly based on the customer's needs. So, based upon all that, I tend not to see that situation. Right, but um, but just following on and then just continuing with you, Janice, on this. Okay, there are there are salespeople right who sometimes find it hard to ask for the check, right? Um, sure. Yeah. So um, so why why is that the case? I think, well, I've never had that problem before, but let, let me just kind of think. So I think that in, when I've been working with certain individuals, certain uh, sales reps, account executives and managers, uh, a, a lot of times it might be that they think they're being too pushy or confrontational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from my perspective, it's that's part of our job. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear from some of my peers as to why they think that, because for me, if you're in sales, you have to be able to progress it and then know 
you know, you have to know when you when you want to walk and you have to know when to, you know, to ask for the check. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lisa, what are your thoughts? Well, I agree with Janice as well. Um, when you think about, you know, asking for the check and, and my earlier statements of about closing being sort of facilitating natural conclusions. So way back in the qualify stage, and this is generic, it's not everybody has a slightly different sales process. But in most cases, in the qualify stage, you know, one of the characteristics is asking them about, you know, do they have budget parameters mm -hmm. or, or you know, you're starting that financial discussion. You're not deep, you're not diving deep, you know, and qualify, but you're, you're, you're bringing it up. But the stage after qualify, whatever that is for, for people, many times it's like something like develop or discover, mm -hmm. um, you are you're you know now you're taking it to the next level so you know who what, what are your budgets what are your financial parameters you know who who does the financial evaluation you know what kind of ROI do you look for what you know whatever's relevant for your business but you are diving in and so the conversation you know, when you get to the end of that sales process and you're facilitating that natural conclusion, it's just a natural continuation of a conversation that started much, much, much earlier. And so, you know, you really don't have to. It, it, it's just, you know, it's it just comes naturally to ask for the contract, ask for the signature, ask for the check, whatever that looks like. Yeah. So I I, I agree. I agree with both of you. I mean, I think a lot of the awkwardness or uh you know not feeling like it's the right time or being reluctant has a lot to do with the how well the process has been executed beforehand um how how about you john um you, you've come across some sales people who are excellent in all the all the areas but then get very kind of a uh, little sketchy when it comes to actually asking for the check yes i think janice and lisa mostly covered it uh, an interesting observation we have when we put people into a negotiation role play in front of the room is is they don't know how to ask. It's amazing. And, and some very good ones will get to that stage where they've done a variety of, uh, they've executed the skills, qualification, evaluation, going and heading towards the commitment stage, and they just simply don't know how to ask for it. So that's one that I've seen, which often amazes me. Um, I asked a director of sales with his people sitting in the room recently for a 10% discount, and he stuck his hand out and said, sure, we'll give that to you. So that was really bad. Um, so it, it's, not just ask, it's, not just, it's not just asking for it. It's knowing how to handle uh, when somebody says they're not ready to do it, they need to speak to another key player. All these things that we should have uncovered that the ladies articulated to this point that should be in place. Um, if they're not in place, I look back at the sales manager and wonder what they're doing with a seller who's going out and uh, either not being able to ask the question or really not being prepared when they do ask the question, uh, can we move this opportunity forward? Because at that point, they should have earned the right to do it. Yeah. So I think it's be, it's great, though. Uh, although this panel, um, you know, we're focusing on closing, which is, a, a, you know, a critical part of the sale. I hope everybody who is attending today listening and those who will be watching the recording, you can see the theme coming through from all of our experts here is that the rigorous attention to your sales process and alignment with the buyer's process is critical. And if you do that well and you make sure that you execute the steps in your sales process properly and you ask the right questions, you establish value and um, all of that, then this shouldn't be an issue. It becomes an issue uh, when it be when it becomes an issue, you should look back at uh, how well you've executed the process to that point. Um, and here, um, and here, talking of which, it's a nice segue. I should have known this was the next slide because I put these together, but actually, I forgotten. <laughs> what are some of this? What are some of the steps to setting up the whole sales process so the close is smooth? Um, uh, John, why don't you continue on this one? What are what are some steps that you can make sure that are in your sales process to make sure this the close is smooth? You alluded to some a moment ago. Yes, as did uh, Janice and Lisa. 
I'll ask the sellers when they get to a workshop, which by the way, the workshop is the beginning of applying success. It's not, it's not where the end all happens. I'll ask them to write down their steps. Say there's 20 people in the class, write down your steps of what you do from how you find a new opportunity to how you close from prospecting to negotiating. So they'll write it down on a piece of paper and then I'll say, now hand it to the person next to you. And could that person follow the steps in that process and successfully identify, qualify, develop, and close business? And there's always laughter and that uncomfortable look that they give to each other. Um, so we help the company and the managers and the sellers to unify what that looks like. Uh, and I will say to them from the front of the room, if it ever goes exactly as we have written it here, please call me because we need to write a book together. It <laughs> says, if you do, if you do this every time, here's what will happen. And if that was the case, I would be retired after 31 years and I'm not. So um, the key to doing it, I believe, um, and I don't know if it was Jan or Lisa who says they help their customers to base it off how people and organizations buy from them. Um, that's the first step. If we don't understand how an organization buys from us, the selling skills, the selling process steps and activities may or may not be relevant. And one way to find out about that is to ask your existing customers. They'll tell you. They'll tell you why you they bought from you. They'll tell you where things went well. They'll tell you where you could have done better. Uh, and there's tons of material out there. We still rely on the research. John, this will be close to your heart that Neil Rackham did a long mm -hmm. time ago yeah. on, on buying behavior. Yeah. And yes, there have been some things that have changed buying behavior like the internet, the great recession, but largely uh, buying activity and human activity is very similar in those capacities. So I think the key is getting that foundational piece on buyers before we start to talk about how to sell to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Janice, uh, you're picking up on that, uh, you know, the buyer behavior and that um, this is something that uh, people still struggle with a little bit. Uh, it, it amazes me. And like John said, I mean, you can ask customers about it and you, there are quite straightforward ways of, of finding out. So um, how do you how do you think um, you can set up a process and get it very buyer aligned? So this is something, you know, kind of near and dear to my heart yeah. since I do a lot of sales process mm -hmm. work. And I agree with everything that John said. Um, but I would take it one step further. So in addition to understanding kind of like the key selling activities that the top performers do and totally understand from John's point of view, it's not going to be if there's a hundred of them, you're not going to do a hundred of those activities, you know, every time. Mm -hmm. But it's a it, it's a good uh barometer. Um, I totally agree with talking to your clients because your clients will tell you uh, why they bought. I like to take it one step further and I like to talk to people who they have tried to sell to but have never been able to sell to. And what I do is, is that I work with my customers and we get on the phone to interview them not to understand what my client did right or wrong in the sales process, but to have them tell us, think about the best sales experience they've ever had and what did that look like? And usually my customer is very, very surprised and gets a much better appreciation as to why maybe they've never been able to sell into you know, that account or accounts <laughs> because they really haven't understood the buying process. They've been selling into this kind of the same Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the client that buy similarly, but have missed uh, the ones that they have not been able to close or, or, or get any revenue from. Yeah, I, I love that because um, I, I just think it's fascinating and we're all guilty of it in many ways uh, is how we often forget that we're customers too when we're involved in sales, right? Um, and we if we forget what the customer experience is like because we're so caught up in the selling. Um, in, in the selling process. Um, how about you, Lisa? What are some ways that you can that you can make sure your sales process is set up so that closing should be smoother? Yeah. So I just had a, 
a quick story about getting that get, getting that check before I answer the question about the sales process. So I was thinking back as we were talking about mm-hmm. how hard it is to get that check. And when I first started with Xerox, I had a little territory and sold the kind of new businesses. And that meant walking door to door, cold calling. And so I get my first sale, bring back the contract. And, you know, my manager says, well, this customer's small. They have no credit history. You have to get a 50 percent down payment check for this contract to go through. Mm -hmm. That was really hard. (laughs) (laughs) So that's when asking for the check. but. I had to do that. And this was at the beginning of my sales career. And so like Janice, you know, I kind of got over the asking for the check uh, mm-hmm. early, early in, in my so, sales life. So did, they, did, did you have any problem getting it? Yeah, but I did get it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to do that. They liked the leasing program, the uh, monthly program that I had proposed <laughs> without the down payment. So uh, getting back to the process uh, things, I, you know, I'll just sort of take a, a, a kind of a tactical um, right. uh, answer to, to, to your question. So like Janice, I also work, do a lot of sales process work. I think I'm involved with like four of them right now. Um, and and uh, what we do is, is you know, start with that buyer. The buyer's at the center, as John said. You know, we develop what would be, what would look like their stages. Everybody's slightly different, but there's also a lot of similarity. And then what we do from there, and I say we, it's usually a sort of a steering committee and it's followed by interviews. So everybody kind of has a little bit of a, a stake in the game, but it's not, you know, it's still kind of a doable project. Um, once we have those things in place, then we define what each stage is. And it's amazing, like even with the steering committee, which might only be, you know, three to six people, it's hard. It's hard to sort of really put that stake in the ground and define. And then we say, what are the characteristics? Characteristics of that stage, and then what actions would the salesperson be doing at that stage? Mm-hmm. What are the sales tools that might be available to them, both internally to help them? Something like pre-call planning would be an internal tool, but then externally, so brochures, websites, case studies, white papers, videos, that kind of thing. And then who are the people or the resources that might help? And we also develop a stage review sales management guide. So if the, if the salesperson is at that stage, let's say it's the qualify stage, we actually put together all the questions that the sales manager could ask any salesperson at that stage to, to coach through and make sure they hit all the all the points of the stage. And sales managers love that. Plus, it's kind of an insurance policy to make sure the sales process really sticks. And then lastly, we develop sales, like a sales questions inventory by stage. So if you're at the discover or the develop stage in your sales process, you know, what are the 10, 15, it doesn't matter how many we get as many out as, as, as the group comes up with, you know, what are those really great sales questions? Now, you're never going to ask all those customer, mm-hmm. no way. But by having them in an inventory, when you're doing your pre-call planning, you can go to that inventory and go, you know what? Ah, I forgot about that question. We need to ask that question. And that becomes part of your pre-call plan. So it's, it's, you don't have to think of them on the spot. You don't even have to think about them. You know, when you're doing your pre-call plan, you can just go to that sales process playbook and you can go, yeah, here's all our possible questions. Let's pick the one or two or three that really are relevant for us. And so that's how to answer your question. Mm -hmm. How do you set it up for success? That's how I have found that it. Uh, really, really then can be cascaded throughout an organization. It could be a sales organization of 10, 20, 50, 500, whatever, because you can, you know, make that electronically available to them, make, you know, it can be a point of need on their phones, you know, whatever that technology is that that backs it up. But but having that kind of information available really, really takes the guesswork out of it. Yeah. And again, and I think that's great, Lisa, because again, I think you've underlined and I think um, Janice and John too have underlined that um, closing is 
you you are setting up your clothes if you are following your process properly and you're qualifying everything and you're going through the stages properly you are set you are at each stage in that process you are setting yourself up for the smoother clothes uh, by doing that um maybe um janice if you want to start off with this one um what are some of the best closing techniques that you've seen uh, work consistently Well, if we think of closing um, as something that happens kind of throughout the sales process, yep. I guess the two that kind of come to mind are one I mentioned a, a, a few minutes ago, which is kind of establishing with your prospective customer right, uh, or customer, but a prospect at this point, um, and, and setting up uh, maybe at the beginning, it's... Uh, five activities that have to be done yeah. and maybe over the course of the time it ends up being 15 or 20. I mean, it should be kind of executive, uh, a kind of an executive view of the type of things that have to be done between now and uh, whatever the date is that they need the value to be established. Right. So that would be, right. uh, you know, in my case, I do a lot of work with technology companies, so it wouldn't just be closing the contract, but it would be implementing it and ensuring that the customer is getting the value that they were hoping to get. And I believe that if you start that early in the sales process and, and the customer gets accustomed to reviewing that document mm -hmm. and you're both on the same page and as things start, priorities start changing, uh, you know, uh, people start moving, you know, in the organization, in these large organization, it allows you to get yourself back on track. So that's one thing. And like I said, I've seen it called a joint evaluation plan. I've seen it called a sequence of events plan. I've seen it called a closing plan. I would, I would, I wouldn't have uh, advised my my customers and, uh, yeah. and and people who have worked for me maybe not to call it that because if we're closing, they're not. Yeah. Um, but, I, but you get the idea. I, I getting your money <laughs> plan. <laughs> yeah, right. so how plan? Yeah. But that's when I love when those stop at contract sign because I go, well, that's not what the customer cares about. But the second thing that I can yeah. that I think about is that I know has worked for me when I was in sales, and it worked so well for me that when I was in management, um, we use this, and then now as a, as a consultant, uh, same. You know, when 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 an executive has a uh, a need. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to accomplish something. They're 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 very engaged, right. and then usually when it gets into this kind of bake off, you know, they they kind of push it to somebody else, and then they kind of come back at the end, right? So they're kind of there at the beginning, and they're at there at the end, and they're keeping tabs, but they may not be talking to the salesperson. Um, this would be even more specifically if it was a uh, a new account versus a, a current customer. Yeah. But one of the techniques that, that we've always used that's worked beautifully is you get your executive with, with the salesperson, right, to meet with the executive on the buyer side early in the sales cycle and establish relationship and start validating mm -hmm. and confirming some of the information that you have been uh, gathering in your discovery phase. And why that's always been um, a, a good best practice is because if things go kind of off the rails at different uh, at different parts of the sales process, there's been a relationship where the executives yeah. can contact each other. Yeah, that's I like that. That's that's a great right? piece of advice. And then if the executive can't get in touch with that other person, that tells you a lot as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that piece of advice. Um, John, how about you? What are some of the best closing techniques you've seen? <laughs> that is. Um... That is clever and important, Janice, for sure. I would say to add on to that and to borrow from your idea, can we get them back together when it comes time to present? And I'm not making it the closing meeting. I'm making it the presentation meeting where we'll come in and we'll talk about products, services, capabilities, whatever it is. And if we can get them all back together as Everybody on this webinar knows we have to be in front of that decision maker to ask for the business. Otherwise, you have a person who can't say yes, but can say no. Um, can we get them back in the room together? And is it the dreaded buying committee of seven people, always an odd number? 
Uh, but I've seen some of the best closers be able to do that to get them back in. Uh, this would not be the scenario with an RFP or an RFQ, which is clearly defined how you're going to sell and they'll let you know when they select the winner. But can you, after you've set that up, Janice, can you get the people back in the room to sit down and go through that presentation proposal with you? If everybody agrees, let's move the opportunity forward. Um, I love it. The, and the other, the other part in the best closing techniques, and you can read in the back of the airplane magazine that you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate, and blah, 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 all these things. Um, there's a very defined skill around closing um, techniques that can be used and different questions to ask, but I still think the most powerful thing that a salesperson can do when they're asking for the business, this all, also goes for people who run sales process workshops like myself is to be quiet, is to use silence. Once you ask the question, and I know everybody on the calls heard this before, but doing it is very different. Mm -hmm. Once you've asked the question, be quiet. If you have teenagers, you'll appreciate the ability to be quiet like I do. But at, once you ask that question, be quiet. Yeah, um, I, I, that's a great point, John, because I think um, – uh, I've talked about this on a number of interviews and, and discussions before about our fear of silence, like people's fear, the need to fill the gap, right, rather than giving the buyer the space to think and to, to make a decision or, or the process or whatever they need to do. Um, Lisa, your thoughts? What are, you, what are some of the best uh, techniques you've seen? Yeah, so I, I guess – Two things uh, that, that that I would share. One best practice uh, in my book is to go back to that sales process that 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 you know all that work went into because at that stage we've already identified mm -hmm. really great questions you know for that customer for that industry and things can be very very different today even in my world with with the big contracts i have one of my clients closed a million dollar plus contract and never met the customer mm -hmm. it was all email and phone including you know all the way through closure yeah so that's you know that never used to happen there always used to be you know you'd have to be there you'd have to you know you'd have a meeting that kind of thing um but but you know some of these software companies, it's just, you know, that, you know, things are, are, are sort of changing, even with the very, very big transactions. Um, and the second thing, so yeah, go, go to the work that you already did to identify for your company and your industry, what works best. So that's the first suggestion. The second one I like to use, I go completely other way in terms of the, all those traditional closing techniques. And I just like to use like regular language, mm -hmm. just, okay, are we, so it sounds like we kind of are on the same page. Are we ready to go to the next step or what do we need to do to get this contract signed or, you know, whatever is natural for that person, just, you know, plain language, not rehearsed, really not even any techniques, just, you know, a natural facilitation to conclusion and um and so that you know I, that's what i do in in how i close that's that's when we talk about uh closing you know with my clients it's like think through it you know before and and, and capture what works best and then when it comes time just be yourself and use natural words don't you don't need anything else yeah, I, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, the the whole idea of just being authentic and um, you know being real uh, and and that natural flow. I think that's uh, I think that really marks uh, somebody stands out when they do that, opposed to somebody who is maybe you know a little more rote. Um, yes. Okay, so we're bumping up against the, the end of our time. So I just wanted to give the, each of the panelists uh, an opportunity just to deliver a final uh, quick insight to everybody who's listening. Um, anything else, um, John, that you want to share a last quick insight with everyone? I get asked frequently if I have any tips, do I have any secrets, do I have any magic bullets and the answer is no 
I don't. And I don't think anybody who's been successful in sales for a period of time will say that there is. There's a focus on doing ordinary things extremely well. I think that's the key. If you want to talk about negotiating and closing, or you want to talk about qualifying any of those other stages or skills that get matched up with being successful in sales. So uh, I got some good ideas here today from my colleagues on the panel. And I encourage the people on the webinar to do the same, treating their profession sales as something where you have to apply and develop your skills on a regular basis. Uh, if you come up with a, um, a magic bullet, you, you would be uh, wealthy writing a book and collecting those royalties. I just don't think it's out there. I think buyers are extremely talented. They're getting more and more information as we go, and the sellers have to keep pace on all of their skills, not just closing. But uh, thanks for including me today. Yeah. And uh, Janice, last quick insight. Yeah, I think it's interesting what John just said and just kind of take that to the next level. I, I, I think that the days of taking what's in your bag and trying to push that, you know, push that boulder up the hill or you know, throw the throw it at the wall and hope that something sticks is is way over. I'm surprised uh, that there are still so many salespeople that sell that way. Um, I think it's a, a hard way of selling. I think it's a hard way of getting any kind of closing uh, at that point. And so I guess, you know, my insights would be, you know, have a good sales process, but more importantly, have a good buying process mm -hmm. and really spend the time to understand, uh, you know, your customers, your accounts, your territory, depending if you're, uh, you know, uh, managing one account or you have a territory and try to understand where the executives are spending their time, money and resources. And if you have a solution to help them, then that's where you want to spend your time, money and resources. And that will make it a lot easier for the close, if you will. If I'm using close in the tradi you know, yeah. traditional, you know, always be closing, ABC, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, then that would be my, my insight. And I also want to say thank you for, uh, for the invitation. Yeah. And Lisa, quick last insight. Yes, John, I always love to, to be on a panel or a webinar with you. So thank you. I actually have a silver bullet. I, ha I have <laughs> an idea that is 100% guaranteed to increase your sales effectiveness. It works every single time. It's absolutely invaluable. And that is the pre-call plan. Yeah, I, I would if agree with you. you. Yep. If you commit to pre-call planning, you will improve your close ratios, guaranteed. I've seen statistics, minimum of 20%. I've seen up to, to uh, 40 or 50%, but you are improving the quality of the sales conversation and that works. So it's that's my advice. Yeah, no, that's, that's great, Lisa. I totally agree with you. And uh, when I worked at Hathaway, that was one of the leading indicators of success that we could actually show to customers was that um, the ones who did call planning, you know, were ahead of the game. And that always turned out that those were the ones who were more successful. Um, but it's funny. Uh, and I said this, I talked about this recently on something, but you, you'll always see on every salesperson's calendar, you will see the appointments that are coming up, right, with the, you know, the calls that they have. But yeah. how many of them can you look at their calendar and see a half hour put aside for call planning? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's astounding to me when the answer when there is a silver bullet, it works like a charm, and it's right there. There's no barrier to entry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just before you guys go, I want to make sure that you all just um, let everybody know how they can contact you and find out more about you. Obviously, your information will be up on is up on Sales Pop. But just quickly, uh, Janice, how can people contact you and find out more about you? On LinkedIn, uh, Janice Mars. Uh, on Twitter, at Janice Mars. On Instagram, Mars underscore Janice. I'm, I'm, I'm quite easy to get in contact with, and I would love to hear from anybody. Yeah, and John? All of the above, as Janice mentioned, um, the easiest way to get me is to send a text message, 858-518-7039. Thanks again, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And Lisa? 
Yes, LinkedIn and my website, www.toplinesales.com or lisa at toplinesales.com, email. Perfect. Well, listen, I want to thank everybody. This is uh, John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, uh, and everybody who attended. And we've got some very nice comments from some of the uh, attendees to thank you all for a great webinar. Uh, I really encourage uh, the, the the attendees to share this. You will get the link uh, with the recording, so please uh, share this. Anybody who wasn't here today will also get the link. Uh, Janice, John, Lisa, this is a fascinating conversation. Um, and some what I love about a panel discussion like this is that there's real practical uh, there's real practical tips in here uh, for people to execute on immediately. So again, thanks for your attendance today, and thank you to the panel and we'll see you all again for a panel discussion very soon so i encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net the online sales magazine also subscribe to our youtube channel and then comment get involved in the conversation love to hear what you have to say